So here we are today. We've got the finale on how to actually build a supply chain in North America. We're taking on a very complicated topic and one that we've yet to see the media cover properly. So we're going to do it ourselves. Gentlemen, we have, of course, the, uh, the gentleman who coined the term technology metals, Jack Lifton. And Alistair, of course, you're one of the top rare earth experts with over 25 years of experience, and you've worked uh, a great deal in China, for instance, correct? Yeah, I okay. actually lived there, too. Fantastic. Okay, so here's where we're at. We're now at the point where we're taking the metals and we're turning them into magnets, which is stage six, which is why no one can really follow this story in the media, because there's so many stages. All right. Alistair, let's start with you. Do we have anyone in the United States who is currently taking these alloys and turning them into magnets? When it comes to neodymium iron boron, uh, no. Uh, they may buy some of the larger blocks from, say, Japan and then slice and dice them into smaller uh, magnets. But that would be about the only, uh, quote, manufacturing that is done stateside. And Jack, what about less common metals? What about them? Well, less common metals is a British company. Okay. They they are making uh, alloy, but I think most of the alloy they make is samarium cobalt, I believe. Uh, no, they're working on neodymium iron boron. They actually have set up two neodymium metal furnaces uh, mm -hmm. that are similar to what is used in China, but they've had to put in all the environmental safety standards to be able to do that. So they are doing that as well as samarium cobalt. But uh, their challenge is accessing competitively the neodymium oxide. Right. So so let me just understand. In order to, to achieve the sustainability model, I think, Jack, you should actually define what it is the U.S. military defines as achieving or meeting their sustainability criteria. They, they don't want any rare earth permanent magnet aspect done in China. In other words, the only thing they'll accept from China is the raw material, the unfinished ore, uh, which is what the Chinese do not <laughs> export. So, so uh, there's nothing they can get from China. They admit that if they had to buy ore from China and China would sell it, they would do it. But they want the extraction, separation, metal and alloy making and magnet making all done either in the United States domestically or in NATO or CETO ally countries. And of course, what do we do then, Jack, when we have Mountain Pass, for instance, having, you know, one of the uh, major shareholders now, are they not the Chinese? Yes. Okay. So well, how does this uh, affect their criteria? Well, they are not willing to accept material from Mountain Pass because of the, uh, the percentage it's less than 10 percent mp says is owned by shanghi industries which is a vertically integrated magnet supplier actually so uh they don't want any they don't want material from mountain pass at this point well will they take for instance rare earths found in you know romania the actual uh no, initial point no it does it, so we no, actually have um, to find it on the american soil or can i no no it can be canadian or australian also and of course, Alistair, I'd love to hear your points on this. Uh, yeah, I think there's obviously Canada is now proactively looking into uh, the critical materials of the next decade or so and have initiated a study uh, by Roskills in London. And when it comes to Australia, they're actually more proactive. Uh, they've set up an R&D uh, center, I believe, and they're also talking about uh, low interest loan funding from the government to get some of these critical material projects off the ground. So, um, you know, hopefully Canada can step forward a little bit more proactively in the future. Um, I know they're talking with Europe more than they are, I think, the U.S. at this stage of development. Well, we get a lot of visitors from France, for instance. Okay. Um, final question in this stage, Alistair, what was the seventh one? That's where you actually take the magnet. The, the magnet. Yeah, and then you turn it into a motor or some other, like for MRIs, you would uh, 
use the magnet uh, wind turbines also for uh, some of the others it's mostly the motors that uh, would have to be assembled uh, even uh, hard disk drives for computers and so forth so the assembly of components uh, is something that needs to be uh, done in the US to get you know more of the value you're basically trying to do what China has done over the last two decades and that is proactively bring the value-added chain into uh, their backyard so Jack what what can we do could we actually find one company to simplify this process to do all of the seven stages or is this just that, too no, incomprehensible what you just said is the dream of the US Defense Department they would like a major corporation to take over the management of the of the recreation of a North American or at least a domestic American and allied uh, countries uh, supply chain and so the problem they have is that they would like a Northrop or a, a General Atomics or uh, Halliburton somebody with with experience in building plants uh, and in managing things the way the US Defense Department works it buys from systems integrators let me tell you what that means when, when people say the United States Defense Department buys an F-35 fighter plane, that's true. But they, but they buy that, let's say, from Northrop. Northrop is called the systems integrator. It is responsible for buying all of the things you need to build that plane. It doesn't make all those things, certainly. Northrop doesn't make aluminum, steel, titanium, rare earths, etc. They're looking for somebody like that. To manage a system the answer they're getting is a uniform resounding no because there's no profit in it for these companies that are multi-billion dollars a month revenue they're saying so what's this rare earth industry for the for the military worth the answer is maybe a hundred million dollars a year and it would require a couple of hundred million dollars to build the supply chain without a mine yeah. nobody's going to do it they, they, everybody says no. So right now they're trying to figure out how to do it and what they can do. That's the problem. Sorry, yeah. Alistair, I got to redirect back at Jack here. Okay, but at the beginning of this conversation, and this is my holiday greetings to Investor Intel uh, audience members, once and for all, three of us are going to solve this problem. <laughs> In this yeah. interview series, we all three of us said that this problem needs to be addressed and we need to provide a solution, but you just explained why nobody will do it. So how do we talk somebody into doing this? Well, that's not actually what's happened is, the, the answer is, is real simple for the Defense Department. They can offer this on a cost plus basis, just like they've done for, for their entire history. If they would say to a company, all right, whatever it costs you, it, it, per kilogram, let's say, or whatever to deliver. Um, well, you add 10, 20, 30 percent to that, and that's what we'll pay. But of course, then they want to see the books. That's a problem. But um, that, that's one way. The other way is for private equity to take a hard look at this and try and get a larger uh, market than the military, which is actually only less than 10 percent of the American market for magnets. The real markets, the consumer economy, but the consumer economy doesn't buy magnets. They buy assemblies, they buy devices, they buy components that have rare earth magnets in it. It's a big challenge. Now, I can tell you this: a lot of people are looking at this right now. A lot of private equity people are looking at this. There's a chance they might do it. There's even a chance the Defense Department might decide, okay, let's do it cost plus and try and find somebody, or maybe they have. But there's a lot going on. But the wheels of government grind very, very slow. Okay, so uh, they yell and scream about, you've got to do this right away. And the Department of the Army has a solicitation due next Monday for heavy rare earth separation. And they're asking for a 10-year plan. I guarantee you that people like Linus will be submitting on that. And Alistair, I would like you just to sum all of this up in this particular series and don't worry everybody out there in investor intel land we're going to be doing more of these uh, can you just provide what recommendation you would like to give for us to actually achieve this goal of course 
to achieve this goal is going to take a couple of different skill sets. It's one set of skills to get something out of the ground and turn it into a separated oxide. And that that is completely different than metallization and alloy production and then getting into the assembly. So you've basically got three different types of industries that need to be managed. And I think that's where you're going to have to have someone with a vision uh, to be able to bring that type of team together to be able to manage uh, such a diverse uh, set of skills. Okay. That's true. On that note, thank you both. We'd like to say happy holidays, and we'll discuss these visionaries in the future. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, Alistair. Welcome. You're welcome.